And I think when you talk about carbon, most people think this is an environmentalist fringe group and this is never going to affect agriculture. Uh, but the simple fact of the matter is it's not only environmentalists who care about carbon. I think we're all going to have to start caring about carbon in the near future. I love this cartoon because this, this kind of embodies what I think greenwashing is, where everyone I think thinks this is what carbon is. We have a lumberjack with a sapling and he's going to cut down a tree and he says, look, oh, contrary environmentalists, I'm now environmentally friendly because my eco chainsaw is fueled by wind credits, not petroleum. I'm offsetting my carbon dioxide with this sapling and even chewing tobacco that is free trade organic. So step aside while I open up an environmental can of you know what on this tree. And I think this is what we think about when we think of carbon, right? This left fringe that's, that's got an agenda and they're going to push it on everybody. And this is my personal favorite. Here's a Ford Taurus with their carbon offset attached to the bumper, right? But there's a more serious side to carbon that I think a lot of us don't realize. And, and you know, Walmart's talking and whether they actually go through with this or not, it's a different matter. But they're talking about having a sustainability index with carbon as a part of that factor. Uh, and essentially the index has three parts and uh, in sake of time I'll skip this but they sent this very index out to all of their vendors which is very important this is directly off the Walmart index and if you notice they say what is your total annual greenhouse gas emissions reported in the most recent year so they're asking their vendors are you taking a proactive role in measuring the greenhouse gas emissions that you have and have you set publicly available greenhouse gas reduction targets yet and if so what are they Okay, so this is going to affect us probably as an industry, uh, which will trickle down to producers as well. And they also ask if you're measuring water and how much water you're using. So this again can affect the, the rice industry. The second part of the Walmart sustainability index that are thinking about putting out is actually carbon footprinting, which is what I'll talk about today for the rice industry, all of their products, right? So what they want to be able to do is to give their consumers a possible index and they haven't decided what that'll be yet for to let consumers make up their mind uh, based on a score, be it like a consumer reports index or not, what product they want to buy based off a series of environmental factors, right? So suddenly it's not the guy with the carbon offset on the back of his Ford Taurus. These are factors that could affect uh, agriculture. Uh, and many businesses, Walmart included, are attempting to gain a green advantage by marketing products as environmentally friendly. I don't go to Starbucks because as an assistant professor I can't afford to, but if you did, you'd notice on their cups they have logos for all sorts of environmental groups now. I mean, they got the panda bear for the World Wildlife Foundation, the, the, tree, the frog for the National what, uh, Rainforest Alliance. What this is signaling to us is that there's consumer demand for this, right? Consumers are demanding more environmentally friendly products. Uh, and lastly, we have the government as well. The well, government, the Waxman Markey bill failed, but essentially that would have been a cap and trade like uh, policy on the amount of carbon we can release. So you don't have to be an economist to realize that if we have consumer demand and we have industry pressure and government pressure, this isn't some fringe topic anymore. Uh, this looks like even if one or two of these uh, factors fade, it might be here to stay. So what can we do to start preparing ourselves for that? And what I say is, okay, so the government cares about this, so why as a producer should I give a rip about carbon? Well, the simple fact of the matter is, is the areas where you typically release the most carbon are also the areas where if you can reduce that carbon, you'd also increase economic profit. Uh, so that's, that begs the question. So the two, the two major components of a carbon footprint for rice are diesel fuel use for irrigation and nitrogen fertilizer application. And I went on the tour today, and I always said I wanted to be an agronomist uh, if I had to go back and do it again. But after going on that tour, I'm glad I stayed behind a computer all day because I almost sweat to death. Uh, but on Trent Roberts and Nathan Slayton did a great job about that nitrogen efficiency testing, right? Becoming more efficient, you might put less nitrogen on. Well, if that's the case, you would lower your carbon footprint. Now, you're not, lowering, you're not putting less nitrogen on to lower your carbon footprint, but it's a, it's a cause and effect thing. And that's something the industry as a whole could put forward uh, as being more efficient with carbon release. The same with on-farm reservoirs. You reduce the amount of carbon you uh, would release because you would not uh, pump from such a great depth. Now again, you're not going to build an on-farm reservoir to get carbon credits, but that's something that you could possibly gain revenue from and if an offset program was uh, entered. Uh, so most of the time, lowering your carbon footprint runs parallel with increasing economic profit. So that's really good news whether you are a producer or an environmentalist. 
Uh, so thus, agriculture and many other industries are trying to become more efficient with the amount of carbon they release into the atmosphere. So what, what we did, and I should say my co-author is, is Dr. Mike Pop, who will present after me. So if you have any hard questions, just give them all to him and, and, and not me. Uh, but what we did is we took the good extension budget that the extension service puts out and we carbon footprinted it. So this was right, conventional rice on silt limbs in e eastern Arkansas. So we took the amount of, let's just take diesel fuel down there. Uh, for flooding rice, it's recommended 30.66. Uh, uh, we put that into gallons. Uh, it takes about 30.66 gallons on average uh, of diesel fuel to flood up rice. Well, of a carbon equivalent of 7.01, which means if you burn one gallon of diesel fuel, you release 7.01 pounds of carbon in the, in the atmosphere. We find that you, just by flooding alone, you release 214 pounds of carbon in the atmosphere. So that totals when we take in nitrous oxide, that for an acre of rice, we're releasing roughly 757 pounds of carbon in the atmosphere. Now, what if we went to an on-farm reservoir? Everything's the exact same, but we'd reduce it to 667. You'd, so you'd save roughly 81 pounds of carbon uh, per acre. And again, you're not building on-farm reservoirs to save carbon. But if the government starts paying you to reduce your carbon, this could be a nice supplemental income. You're not going to get rich off of it. But more importantly, you could say as an industry as a whole, we're moving forward to reduce our carbon footprint. So what I did is I took the ARPT data and I carbon footprint every rice variety. So this is just for Arkansas County. So each county is going to look different. But what this is, is this is the amount of carbon released to produce uh, one acre of each of these varieties in Arkansas County. And what that's a function of is how susceptible they are to blast and sheath life. And we calculated the carbon equivalent of having to go out there and spray and how much fertilizer is needed for each variety and how much water is needed for each variety. So that's conventionally planted. So if we put an on-farm reservoir, uh, it would look like that. So. We, we drop quite a bit, and in, in fact, uh, if a carbon offset program was introduced and carbon traded at $40 a ton, you could get a rough payment of $1.60 per acre for using a 50% on-farm reservoir if you planted all wells. And again, you're not building on-farm reservoirs for carbon credits, but this is a nice supplemental income you could possibly uh, earn. What we also did is we took net emissions. So agriculture is one of the few industries that you actually sequester carbon into the ground. You know, we take CO2 out of the atmosphere and put it into the ground. Uh, well, most other industries can't do that. So what Mike and I did is we looked at the net footprint for each variety. So you'll notice the, the dark line is zero. And if you're below zero, it means you're a net sequesterer of carbon. And if you're above it, you're a net emitter. Now here, 729 and 723 look good. And each county is going to be different. So don't take this uh, as, as the gold standard because each county is going to be different and each farm will be different as well. Uh, but what this means is that if there was a carbon offset payment, you could potentially get payments for uh, CL 151, 723, and 729 because up to the farm gate, you're actually taking more carbon in than you're releasing. Uh, and this is a, a the, the formula for this is rich in calculus and I make everyone leave the room if I put it up there. If you're interested on in how we calculated this, I'd be glad to talk to you more uh, after after the, the 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 session, but what this says is, look, you know, carbon can maybe be our friend in some cases uh, and and get us some money. But I should say that this does not take methane emissions into account, and that's very uh, important. Uh, so here is what the actual breakdown. Here is the uh, carbon footprint for the diesel, for the fungicide, the pesticide, the fertilizer, the nitrous oxide and the emissions, and we see Templeton and the hybrids fare really well in emissions because they don't require as much fertilizer. Uh, and here is, uh, and the hybrids are net sequesters because on average, in the way we calculated this, they have a high biomass and high harvest index. So does this mean everyone should run out and plant 723? Well, not even close because there's no carbon market now and uh, you, you really wouldn't get any carbon benefits from, from, from doing that. Uh, and plus, again, that was just for one county. And in some other counties, Wells is the highest sequesterer. So again, it'd be myopic to, to your farm. But what this does illustrate is there's a possibility to benefit from carbon offsets. Uh, and as importantly, politically speaking, we talk oftentimes about cap and trade, and we talk about carbon offset payments. And the big difference in my mind is one is a carrot and one is a stick. 
right? The cap and trade says you can only release X amount of carbon, and if you release more, I'm going to slap you on the hand, okay? The offset program says, well, if you're a net sequesterer, I'll actually pay you uh, to reduce the amount of carbon, or you can switch crops and I'll pay you. So, for example, we have wells, which it's net emissions in Arkansas County is estimated at about 790 pounds, right? That would be the cap and trade. That's how we'd look at that. Well, under a carbon offset payment, we take in sequestration, which is really important because all rice takes in uh, CO2 and greenhouse gas and puts it, stores it underground. So it, it seems to me as an industry as a whole, we should be pushing for the carrot rather than the stick because it looks like uh, there's, there's more opportunities. And like I said earlier, agriculture is one of the few industries we actually sequester uh, carbon in. So again, given that three-headed monster of the government, of consumer demand, and industry pressure, I really don't think that we're gonna fall back on this carbon thing like that first cartoon I showed you. I, I, my personal opinion is, is it's here to stay, but in what form it's here to stay in is what it's to be determined. Uh, but the take home message for me is this. this uh, you can either be an environmentalist who happens to increase their economic profits or you could be a profit maximizing producer who happens to be improving the environment. But they're the same thing from what I've shown here. And it just depends what room you're talking to and what audience you're talking to. If you want to say, I'm an environmentalist, but I'm lowering my carbon footprint, or I'm lowering my carbon footprint, but I'm also making more money. You know? So that's, it's, it's interesting to look at it that because I think oftentimes we think, oh, if I'm lowering my carbon footprint, I'm losing money. But Contraire, it's oftentimes if you lower your carbon footprint, you can make more uh, money. So hopefully I haven't thoroughly confused you. and. Uh